you would, we're going to get into the Word this morning. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your Word, which is the truth. And we have a ready reception to what's offered us. We're ready to take hold of it. We thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth. And we thank you for all that you're going to accomplish through your Word in us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. We've been sharing with you on the subject of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the difference between the baptism, the receiving, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the working of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the working of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. We've talked about how to be led by the Holy Spirit and factors that are essential if you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life. Today we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Very important that we understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Bible expressly addresses this when it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Or the word ignorant means not to know. We are to know about the gifts of the Spirit. And now when it says spiritual gifts, actually the word gifts, it's italicized in the Greek, meaning it's not even there. It's been added by the translators to describe what it's talking about. It really means concerning spirituals or spiritual things. Brethren, I would not have you ignorant. It's talking about the gifts of the Spirit in the sense because they are from the Holy Spirit and that we'll see that they're going to be listed uh, in a few uh, verses down. And he talks about how that they were Gentiles carried away into the dumb idols as even as they were led, which they were following after and worshiping. He says, Wherefore I give you to understand, no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Notice, he's referring to those who are operating the gifts of the Spirit are speaking by the Spirit of God. When you are operating in the gifts of the Spirit, you are speaking by the Holy Spirit who is operating through you. Because the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us, He not only wants to dwell in us, but to walk in us and manifest Himself in us and through us. And one of the ways is He's going to speak through you. You're going to be speaking by the Spirit of God. Of course, there were some people there that were off track and they were apparently speaking things calling Jesus accursed and he was correcting them here in Corinth, indicating the fact that uh, no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Then he comes down and he begins to talk about these gifts. He says, now there are diversities of gifts and so we see that these are gifts even though it wasn't in the original, the first one but actually wasn't there. There's diversities of gifts, or different gifts, but the same Spirit. The same Spirit is operating all of these gifts. Then we see in verse 5, there's differences of administrations, or the way it's served, but the same Lord. Notice the verse before it said the same Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit's involved in the operation of it. Here it says the same Lord. Well, who's the Lord? Jesus. That shows you that Jesus is involved in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit as well. And then it goes on and says, There are diversities of operations, but the same God which worketh all and on. This is referring to the Father God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in the gifts of the, of the Spirit. They're not just the Holy Spirit only. No. And the, here it says, Diversities of operations. These are actually, it's a Greek word, energ, 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 emea, which means the effective operation of. There's differences of the way that they operate but it's God which worketh all. They're divine energy, so to speak. That's where we get our word energy from, or operations, coming from the Father. So we see that the gifts of the Spirit, they're operated by the Father and through Jesus our Lord and the Holy Spirit manifesting themselves them to us. And these are div divine uh, operations that are coming from Him that are going to be administered or served through the direction of the Lord, and they're going to be different operations of, or different uh, uh, gifts that are going to function by the same Spirit. Then it comes down to verse 7 and it says, the manifestation of the Spirit. This tells you what the gifts of the Spirit are. They are the Holy Spirit manifesting Himself. And notice it says, it's given to every man. It's given to everyone or each person to profit with all. What's the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit? They're given to profit others, not for yourself. He's not going to give gifts of the Spirit for yourself. He gives the gifts of the Spirit for the profiting of others. And notice it says He gives them to every man. That means that they aren't just given to a few people here or a few people there. 
Many people have had the mistaken idea that God just gives a gifts to certain people and that's it. Oh no, you have the Holy Spirit in you. He's given you at least one gift because he gives the gift manifestation of the Spirit to every man. So God has given you at least one gift of the Spirit or more and he wants the Holy Spirit to manifest through you to profit with all. Goes on and begins to talk about these gifts of the Spirit. There are nine gifts of the Spirit that are listed. We see in verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing. Healing is actually plural in the Greek, as Young's brings out. There are different gifts of healings. You might have a gift of healing that works in one area. Someone else might have a gift of healing that works in another area. So as you minister to people and lay hands on them and pray for them, you may see that certain areas where you actually saw a mighty gift of healing flow through you to manifest a healing. In other cases, you may not have seen an instantaneous type of healing because most of the time the gifts of healings in operation will bring a manifested healing almost instantly. And then he goes on and says, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. There are three gifts that reveal something. They are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. There are three gifts that do something, and those are the gift of faith, the gifts of healings, and the working of miracles. And there are three that say something, and that is the gift of prophecy, diverse kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. So these gifts of the Spirit are going to either reveal something, do something, or say something. And there is something important we need to understand about how they operate. Now, normally, revelation gifts will also operate with ministry gifts that are given to particular people. For instance, a person who has a ministry gift, and ministry gifts, as far as a calling, such as apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, whatever, usually have gifts that go with it, and they're separate from the gifts of the Spirit. You don't have to be called to a, a, a five-fold ministry position to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. But we see that the prophet will normally operate in these revelation gifts, at least one of them, probably all of them, at one time or another. He'll operate in the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. We see that those that are the evangelists will usually operate in the power gifts. And we see people that have an evangelist gifting in their life where they go forth and they preach the gospel and people get saved. And also we see signs and wonders and miracles operating through them because that's the gift of faith, gifts of healings, and working of miracles. And you, there's noted evangelists that operate today in the world. And you see those gifts operating through them. And then the vocal gifts, now they can operate through anybody, and prophecy is especially something that God wants us to seek after. Now let's talk about these nine gifts of spirit and define them for you and give some examples of them uh, as we're going through this. The word of wisdom, this is a word. It is not all wisdom. It is a word of wisdom. And we're talking about the word of wisdom. It is a supernatural revelation. All the gifts of the Spirit are supernatural by the Spirit of God. They're not according to your mind or something that you know or according to what you see in the natural. No, they are spiritual, spiritual gifts. They are supernatural. The word of wisdom is a super, supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit concerning the divine purpose in the mind and the will of God. It is something that is going to happen, his purpose of what he intends to happen. The word of wisdom deals with things that are going to happen in the future. That's the revelation part of them. That means all prophecies in the Bible would really be categorized as words of wisdom that are going to come forth. So it is a supernatural revelation concerning the divine purpose in the mind and the will of God. And we know that the Holy Spirit will show us the things to come. We saw that scripture before in John chapter 16 and verse 13 where it speaks of the fact that the Holy Spirit, the last part of this verse, says He will show you things to come. Well, that's talking about things that are in the, the purpose of God, His divine purpose in His mind and will, things that are going to come to pass. And again, these are things that are future, 
Word of Wisdom deals with things that are of future. Let's look at an instance where this is shown in the Word, in Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, we pick up over here in verse 5. Here's where Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, Here I pray you this dream which I've dreamed. And this dream was a word of wisdom that something was, that was going to happen, not had happened, so it was a future event like a prophecy, so to speak. And he said, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. Lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about it and made obeisance to my sheaf, the sheaf being the person. So he's talking about the fact that they were going to bow down to him. That's what the re revelation was. His brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Yet that was a true statement that God made of what was going to happen in the future. And then he dreamed another dream, which is another word of wisdom. And he told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars made obeisance to me. He told it to his father and to his brethren. His father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Well, of course, then that was a word of wisdom in the future. His brother and brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Even though he rebuked him, he paid attention to that saying. And, of course, it came to pass. If you remember, after the famine, and Joseph was in Egypt and made the prime minister, and they had to come to get food, and they came, and they had to bow down before him. And so we see that that came to pass. That is an example of how God will bring a word of wisdom. It can be through a dream. It can be through a vision. It could be something that he speaks to you specifically. And we'll look at more of these as we're going through uh, talking about this, especially tonight. Now, the word of knowledge is the second one. The word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit as well. But it is of certain facts that are either present or past. They already are presently occurring right now or will, are in the past. And they're in the mind of God concerning people or places or things of some sort. So it is a supernatural revelation of facts that are present or past. Not something that's future, but something that's present now or something that is in the past. Let's look at an example of this in Scripture where Jesus operated in a gift of the Spirit in which, in John chapter 4, we see over in verse 16, here he's talking about the woman at the well. Remember the woman at the well? And Jesus began to speak to her. And in verse 16, he said to her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, no past knowledge, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, present knowledge, that he wasn't, that wasn't even your husband. And that sayest thou truly. Well, that really rang her bell. So you can see the two aspects of the word of knowledge. It's past knowledge. She, he said you had five husbands in the past. And also it's present knowledge, which is saying the one you have now is not even your husband. Showing the fact that the word of knowledge reveals facts that are either present or in the past. Remember, it's not all knowledge. It is a word of knowledge. Now, the purpose of these, remember, is to profit someone. And God wants us to understand that these will come forth. For instance, God may bring a word of wisdom which is speaking something that is going to come to pass. In fact, there was someone that was in Ohio uh, that we just talked to and found out that they actually had a, a word of wisdom, talking about that, the fact that there was going to be an earthquake in Haiti. This person had a word of wisdom, just, just a person that was formerly in, in Ohio in a church. And, uh, you know, just kind of didn't think too much about it, but then, of course, now it came to pass, showing that something that will come to pass. And also, of course, words of knowledge. Uh, we've seen words of knowledge come to pass uh, uh, so, and be revealed to help people. It's always to profit someone. For instance, uh, we've seen words of knowledge, and see, God wants to use people, everybody in this church, to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And let's say one day you, you're here and you get a word of knowledge that comes to you, 
someone has a tumor here or something, and God wants to heal that tumor. That's what comes to you. Well, that would be a word of knowledge. And so you would say, hey, uh, I've got a re revelation, a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. Someone has a tumor here, and they need healing. And we would then, of course, ask, someone here have a tumor and needs healing. And, of course, whoever that was would be confirmed, and the person then would come forward, and we would minister to them, and cast out the demons, minister healing to them for them to be set free. And we've seen that happen in the past, where a word of knowledge will come forth. It is to profit the other person and to minister to a particular need. So this is a very good example of both uh, the, the, the present and the past effects of the word of knowledge and the fact that it is a facts than the present or past. We see an exa another example of this over in Acts. In fact, we see both the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge in this particular setting. In Acts chapter 9, here it's speaking about Saul. Remember, he was converted on the way to Damascus. And we pick up down here in verse 10. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. What is that? That is a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge, the fact that there is somebody who is at the house of Judas, his name is Saul, he's from Tarsus, and what he's doing, he's praying. So he was there, and so this is a word of knowledge that was given to him. He didn't know that whatsoever. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. This relates actually a word of wisdom that was given to Saul, whose name was later ch ch changed to Paul. Because notice, Paul or Saul had seen in a vision someone coming, that means it would be a future event, which is a word of wisdom, coming and putting his hand on him that he would receive his sight. So we see, first of all, the word of knowledge given to Ananias, and then we see the word of wisdom that was given unto Paul, Saul. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said, to him, said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. That shows a fact, a word of knowledge. This guy is a chosen vessel. God knew that. He didn't know that. But he gave him a word of knowledge that was present. This man is a chosen vessel unto me. And then he also mixed that in. God, God spoke to him what the word of wisdom was, which was what the future was for this man, Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. That was what he was called to do. That was a word of wisdom concerning, in the, in the mind of God, his purpose, what God was supposed to, to accomplish through Saul. And so he'll show, I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That also is a word of wisdom, the fact that this guy's going to suffer a lot as he goes forth to preach the gospel. So here we see a word of knowledge and words of wisdom mixed together. And sometimes that'll happen. You may get something, and God shows you something about a, something that's going to happen in the future, and then he may also show you something that's a fact right now that that would be a word of knowledge. So it's good to understand words of knowledge are present or past facts. Word of wisdom is a word regarding something that is in the future. The third revelation gift is discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is supernatural insight into the spirit world where you're going to either see or hear or know by revelation the presence of angels or demons or spirits that are in operation. This is the discerning of spirits. And especially is when you see something or you hear something. I can remember times in the past in our church back in Ohio that uh, people would co I, people come up to me and they'd say, I heard angels singing. They said, I heard the normal congregation, but I heard, this, I heard these angels that were singing while everybody else was singing. And they were involved, they're ministering. Otherwise, you can see these kind of things. And I've also had people who said they've actually seen angels operating in the church, moving around in ministry, seen them or heard them. So it's to hear or see or to know the presence of spirits. 
and you, the people that have this, that sees spirits. If you see spirits, you're seeing them all over the place. And you're not just going to see demons. You're going to see angels as well. Then those are the re those are revelation gift of the discerning of spirits. Let's look at an example of this in Scripture. 2 Kings, chapter 6. 2 Kings, chapter 6. We pick up over here in verse 8. Here's where it's talking here about the prophet Elisha. And remember that uh, what the story is, we read through here in verse 8. The king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with the servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. The king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of him and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Otherwise they were never knowing your plans ahead of time. And some, somebody must be for the king of Israel and telling them what's going on. One of his servants says, None, my lord, otherwise we're not for him, O king, but Elisha the prophet. There's a prophet over there that's in Israel, and he telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Otherwise, when he was speaking words, he was telling him, and so this part here is actually shows that a prophet will operate in the word of knowledge. This is a word of knowledge right here. He was knowing when he said something, he'd have knowledge, a word of knowledge, which he couldn't know, but revealed by the Holy Spirit of what he was speaking. So he'd know everything that was going on. He said, go and spy where he is. Now, you'd think, if he already knows everything that you're speaking, don't you know what he's going to do next? What, the next thing you say? Go and spy where he is that I may f send and fetch him. You think that he's not going to know what you're up to? He's going to know. As I was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, sent he horth, uh, hither horses, horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. When the servant of the man of God was risen, risen early, this is his servant, and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And he says, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He saw in the natural all the armies that had circle, circle, you know, circled the city and were encompassing the place. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they be with them. Now, wait a minute, in the natural, there's just you and me, the servant and the prophet, and all these hosts of all the enemies all over there. It doesn't sound like two is more than all the rest of them. But he had insight, supernatural insight into the realm of the Spirit. Elisha prayed because Elisha could already see what was going on. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And what are we talking about? His spiritual eyes so he'd be able to discern what was happening. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And now instead of just seeing in the natural, he could see in the Spirit. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. These were all the angels. All the warring angels were ready to fight and to deal with that situation. And now he was eyes were open so he could see. So the discerning of spirits is supernatural revelation of being able to see or to hear or to know spirits that are in operation in the realm of the spirit. And especially a lot of people that have this, they will see them or they will hear them. And so you can discern these things. By the way, this discerning of spirits is not the gift of suspicion. Well, I suspicion. I'm suspicious of this person and, you know, figuring out in your mind, he must have such and such. No, no, no. It is a word or a revelation by the Holy Spirit, not you figuring it out in your mind. It's not of the natural, not of you coming to some conclusion yourself. No, it's going to be supernatural revealed by the Holy Spirit. So we see it's supernatural insight into the spirit world, including angels, demons, and wrong spirits influencing people. Then we come to the gift, the power gifts. And these power gifts are gifts that do something. The first one is the gift of faith. The gift of faith is special supernatural faith beyond your normal faith. We all have a general spirit of faith. But the gift of faith is supernatural faith beyond your normal faith, or kind of faith added to your faith by the Holy Spirit, enabling one to expect or sustain or receive a miracle. I'll give an example of this. We see it over in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Here in verse 2, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, 
Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Here God's just giving him general directions what he's supposed to do. It shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I've commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Do ravens do things like that in the natural? No. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and before he went, and he dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Here, because he acted on the word that he told him to do, which was a supernatural word from God, that he was going to receive something from the Lord that God was going to provide, and obviously it was supernatural because ravens now were bringing him bread and flesh, of course, directed by God to bring that to them. And, but him going and being obedient, a gift of faith was an operation to receive this miraculous provision. So a gift of faith is a special supernatural faith by the Holy Spirit that enables you to expect or sustain or receive a miracle. And we're just giving you examples of these. Tonight, we're going to go through looking at many examples of all of these particular gifts. The next gift, a power gift, that does something, these are called power gifts, is the working of miracles. The working of miracles is a supernatural intervention in the ordinary course of nature in temporarily, temporarily altering, suspending, or controlling the laws of nature. Otherwise, it's going to change things. It's going to suspend or alter things. Here is an example of it. It's over in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 4. It says, So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. And as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. Well, an axe head is heavier than water. What's going to happen? It's going to sink to the bottom. And he said, Alas, master, for it is borrowed. Otherwise, it borrowed this thing. I've got to give it back to the guy. The man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. All of a sudden, it came up to the top. Now, that was not normal action. That was not your normal way that nature goes. No, it sinks to the bottom. But that was a supernatural, miraculous work. It was a supernatural intervention in the ordinary, normal course of how the way things are in nature to temporarily alter, suspend, or control the laws of nature or to do things. We see the same thing when Jesus was, you know, here, what's he do? He breaks the bread, you know, and so forth. And what happens? It's multiplied, multiplying the bread. In the natural, that doesn't happen. But that was a supernatural thing where he was multiplying the bread and where they had all these baskets left over to feed the 5,000 people and, and so forth with the, the bread and the fishes that he had. That's a supernatural working of miracles. The other power gift is the gifts of healings. Remember, gifts is plural and healings is plural, meaning that this is talking about different gifts of healings. <coughs> there are some, some, again, some people can have certain gifts. I've heard of people that have had, well, they seem to have a gift of healing that operates, in fact, I know one particular minister uh, that operated in, in gifts of healings, and he seemed to get cancer, people with cancer healed. And another one that seemed to get deaf ears healed. And, and other people that seemed to, remember one man said he prayed for people with heart problems, and God would just like give them a new heart or a working of miracles sometimes, or they just have their whole, their heart would just be totally restored. But they saw it in those particular areas, but not in every area. It was like a particular gift of healing was functioning in that particular area. Now, because you pray for someone and you don't see a miraculous healing of one particular disease or problem, that doesn't mean you don't necessarily have a gift of healing. You might have a gift of healing operating because you might come along and pray for someone in some other area and the power of God will flow through you and the gift of healing will manifest and that person will be healed. So if you see that happen in your life as you're ministering to people, then know that that is a gift of healing that God is using you in, and He wants you to flow forth in that. And He will use you in ministering to people with those particular problems. A supernatural healing disease without any natural means. This has nothing to do with medical science or anything in the natural, or whether you eat right or any of these kinds of things. Let's look at an example here over in John chapter 5. Here, there was in Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. An angel went down at a certain season in the pool and troubled the water. Wherefore then first 
then first, whosoever then first after the, <coughs> excuse me, trouble in the water, stepped in and was made whole of whatever disease he had. That would be a supernatural manifestation of healing to that disease. A certain man was there that had infirmity for 38 years. This guy was bound. When Jesus saw him, he knew that he had now been a long time in that case. He said to him, Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Now Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now, was this guy, his faith, operating to be healed? No. He was just hoping he could get into the water, but everybody else gets in the water before he can get in the water, so he never could get his miracle. But now Jesus comes along to minister that miracle to him. And he says, immediately the man was made whole when he spoke those words, rise up, take thy bed, and walk. This was a gift of healing operating through Jesus. See, one thing we got to understand about Jesus. Jesus had the spirit without measure, as it says in John chapter 3. Here for all of us, the spirit, we all have it in measure, and it's all portioned out to all of us and operating th through us all these different gifts. Jesus had all these things operating in him, and he was functioning in all of these gifts of the Spirit. So we see the fact that here he was operating in the gift of healing that caused this person to immediately be made whole. Usually when a gift of healing is in operation, it causes immediate results. As opposed to normally praying for a person to be healed, like the Bible says you lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, or we anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith and they shall, you know, the Lord shall raise them up, shows the fact that it will happen, but it usually is not an instantaneous type of thing. So we see that gifts of healing are usually instantaneous. Now, you may have a gift of healing. You want to, now the other thing is, say, well, I never I don't feel anything. It's not a feeling thing. You may have a tangible anointing that releases that. Sometimes people do. Or you may have no tangible anointing whatsoever. Don't think that you have to have a feeling Oh, now I'm ready to operate this. No. It's going to be by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't operate according to feelings. Now, sometimes you may have a tangible anointing. Some people do. Some people that have had it, they feel, it's like they would have this, this, this heat would maybe, they'd feel it, you know, and they knew that this was going to flow forth out of them as they ministered to a person. Sometimes that happens. But also, sometimes people, you just feel like you don't feel a thing, and yet a gift of healing would operate through the person. So don't look for feelings or things in the natural to think that, well, I have a gift of the Spirit operating here, you know, because I feel such and such. Uh, you know, it's not based on feelings. So you don't want to, that's not your barometer to try to figure out whether I got something. It's all of the Spirit. We're to go forth and do the Word of God and watch God work. So we see the power gifts, the gift of faith to receive a miracle, uh, uh, working of miracles, which uh, suspends or controls the laws of nature, changes things, and the gift of healing, releasing a healing which is usually instantaneous. Then we see the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit given in a known tongue, in a tongue that's known to the speaker who's doing the speaking. Without any human thinking, he's not planning what he's going to say. Without any human thinking, understood by those present in the the particular assembly of the believers, like in the church, including the speaker. And the result, by the way, is that it's going to produce edification, exhortation, and comfort. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says in verse 3, He that prophesieth speaketh not unto men, uh, I'm sorry, speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. The simple gift of prophecy will edify someone, it will exhort them to do something, it will comfort them in ministering to them in some aspect. For instance, if you have a prophecy that is speaking something to exhort them, such like maybe a word that comes forth, be not afraid, what's that doing? That's exhorting you to not be afraid, or you know, exhorting you not to be afraid. Or it might be something edifying you, something that's going to build you up in some way, you know, what the Lord will do for you. It's edifying you and building you up in some way. Also, exhortations can be where he gives you specific instructions, instructions that, you, I, you know, I say to you to do such and such, and I will perform such and such. It's, it's giving you instructions that are going to be in line with the Word of God. And then comforting, something that's going to comfort you 
and minister to you to bring comforting words. So the simple gift of prophecy actually does not have any revelation in it. A lot of people think a gift of prophecy is, well, somebody's going to give me a revelation of something that's going to happen. No, the simple gift of prophecy has no revelation in it. People that prophesy are going to operate in, uh, to, in a gift that's going to bring exhortation, edification, edification, exhortation, and comfort. At the same time, you can have a gift of prophecy and words of knowledge or words of wisdom or something that are mixed in with it that's all coming forth. For instance, you may speak something and it has the, the elements of edification, exhortation, and comfort in it. And then also it might mix in a word of knowledge that God gives. See, these gifts can combine together to work. They're just not just works one singly. They can combine together. For instance, same kind of thing. Let's say someone has a word of knowledge concerning that God wants to heal someone that has a particular problem. Word of knowledge, and then they feel that they're the one to go and pray for that person, and God's healing, gift of healing operates through them to minister to them. So here we see the combination of these gifts in operation. The gift of prophecy is an important gift because it's one of the gifts that say something. You're going to speak something in order to bring a message to the people. And how do we communicate? Through our words. That's why prophesying is important. In fact, God wants us all to be able to prophesy. Now, let's look at an example in Scripture of where a prophecy came forth. Back in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, here we see Jehoshaphat and how the children of Moab and the children of Ammon all these were coming against Jehoshaphat to battle against them. A great multitude was coming against them. Well, Jehoshaphat feared, in verse 3, set himself to seek the Lord, proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. They're seeking the Lord on what he wants them to do. And they're asking help of the Lord. And so, Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation, and he's praying to God about what to do in the situation. And here we come down to, picking up down here in verse uh, verse 13, he says, All Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children after he had prayed. And then upon Jehaziel, the son of Jack Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Here's one of the guys that's there in the midst of the whole group. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit manifests himself. Because remember, the Holy Spirit is going to manifest himself in these gifts. And what's he begin to do? he begins to prophesy to them. He said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. So here, he's giving them some instructions and exhortation here, and telling them what they should do. Don't be afraid for the big multitude. That was going to minister to them, because certainly they saw this great multitude. Fear was trying to grip them. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Again, speaking something, and the things that are going to come forth are going to be in line with the Word of God. Tomorrow, go ye down against them. Again, he's given instruction. The prophecy is coming forth through him. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. Now, what is this? Not only was he prophesying, speaking something to them, but now we see, what is that? The, he said, he come up by the cliff of Ziz. That shows a word of wisdom, doesn't it? It shows what was going to happen I mean, that was the plan of the enemies, of what they were going to do. They were going to come up, a future event. So there's a word of wisdom mixed in with this. By the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. That's where they were going to be, showing the fact that this is the plans of the enemy that were revealed to him. So we see revelation coming forth in this. Then he goes on and says, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Otherwise, they used to have to fight in a lot of battles. But here he says, you're not going to fight in this battle. Giving them directions of what they're to do. Set yourselves, stand you still. See the salvation of the Lord. O Jude and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And so, certainly the last statement, for the Lord will be with you, that was very comforting to them. So you can see the word of knowledge, the, the, uh, word of knowledge or word of wisdom mixed in here. But this gift of prophecy was bringing exhortation edification, and it was bringing forth comfort to them of, and telling them what God will do for them. That's why prophecy is important. Prophecy is going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you 
The Holy Spirit's going to speak through you to bring something to others that they need to hear. It might be for the whole group. It might be just one particular person. So God wants you to be seeking to prophesy and be ready to prophesy and bring forth what God wants you to speak. Well, the result was he bowed his head, his face to the ground. All Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, and they were worshiping the Lord. And uh, they began to continue to worship him. And then he rose in the morning, went forth, and what happened? Of course, they said here again, he says, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Here, they had to believe and act upon what he told them to do. Then, of course, they appointed the singers unto the Lord, and they began to just praise the Lord. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set the ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. They were come against Judah, and they were smitten. God's word got performed. But notice that as they were seeking the Lord, a prophecy speaking forth in the midst of the congregation brought forth the instructions, the comfort, the direction, mixed in with this, a, word, a supernatural word from the Lord telling them about what, what the enemy, where the enemy was going to be, and then telling them what they should do instead of trying to do it their own way, you know. No, they did exactly what God said. And when you get the plans of the, led by the Holy Spirit revealing these, of course, they saw the great results. So the gift of prophecy is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit in a known tongue without any human thinking. Otherwise, it's not you thinking about what I'm going to say. It is something that is from the Holy Spirit. Usually, it will be spontaneous. It will be instant. Now, sometimes God could give you a word previously and then tell you that he wants you to speak that to the congregation. Those things can happen. Most of the time, prophecy will happen instantaneously from the, what the Lord wants you to speak. And Now, it's not you deciding, well, I'm going to have a word and I'm going to I'm going to get something all together that, that I can speak to the congregation. I had a guy some time back came and he was, he was saying that, he had, that the Holy Spirit was giving him something that he was supposed to speak to the congregation and a, a script, some scripture things that he, and he had it written down like he'd been given it before. But we found out the fact that, no, that wasn't the Holy Spirit giving it to him. This is him trying to make a ministry because he was actually getting these things together and kind of putting together like a prophecy so that he could speak for it, look so everybody would think that, hey, hey this guy's prophesying. He must be real super spiritual and so forth, you know. And one of the ways especially we began to know it because he began to speak some things and they were a little bit off of the Word of God. And uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't do things contrary to the Word of God. It was a little bit off. And then also saw one time when he spoke, spoke something forth that turned out to be something that, that I happened to know that was a known fact and that this person already knew about this fact and he was speaking it like it was a prophecy. Otherwise, this is coming from his mind. He originated this thing. It wasn't the Holy Spirit whatsoever. So, you know, that's why we have to be discerning. You know, we always had to come a negative witness, but, you know, you want to give people the, the benefit of the doubt. You want to follow the Holy Spirit. You, you want to, you know, you don't just jump on them. You know, we always try to give people space to learn and grow and develop on everything. But at the same time, when you find out something's wrong, you have to deal with it, which, of course, we did and, said, and confronted the situation and uh, didn't go over too well, of course, because the person didn't repent, unfortunately, because they were trying to make their own ministry and uh, didn't like the fact that they got caught in what they were doing. But the Holy Spirit made it clear. So the Holy Spirit will reveal things, and we need the Holy Spirit to bring revelation. When he brings revelation and these kind of things, the gifts of the Spirit, talks about how the, the hearts of the people, the people that come in will be made manifest, and God will just work, and boy, you're going to see God's in your midst. You spoke some things I hear, need to hear. I've had times when uh, I remember one particular person that one time I spoke out, it was a word, all it was was just prophecy of edification, edification, exhortation, and comfort about some specific things. And a person came up to me afterwards and said, the exact thing that you spoke is exactly what I heard myself on the way to church. And said, you know, this was confirming and edifying and really helping me to see what I was supposed to do. Now, did I know anything? Had I talked to the person? No. I knew nothing. All I was doing was just speaking forth whatever just came. And so God will use that to minister to people. This is why, you know, maybe you're seeking something about some, an answer on something. And God drops something in you. Don't just think that, well, I wonder why that came to my mind. Speak it forth 
to release it so that it can minister to people. And so God can do great things uh, through the gifts of the Spirit to minister to people. Now then the next one, the eighth one, which is the second one of the uh, vocal gifts, these are ones that say something, is the diverse kinds of tongues. Diverse kinds of tongues is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit in an unknown tongue. You don't know what you're speaking. An unknown tongue or language, never learned by the speaker and not understood by the speaker. It's not you know in some other language. And when a gift of tongues comes in manifestation, it is to be interpreted. Now, we must understand why does a gift of tongues come forth in a congregation? It will come forth if there is an unbeliever in the midst for the purpose of revealing the fact that God is in their midst. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. You know, speaking something out in tongues for us that already are believers, it's not going to do anything for us. But what's it going to do? It's to them that believe not. It's a sign to those that believe not. Something supernatural is going on here. But prophecy, which is speaking in your known language, serveth not for them that believe not. It's not for those that are unbelievers. But it's for them which believe. In other words, God's not going to have prophecies for unbelievers. They need to come to the Lord because God's going to speak things to believers to exhort them, edify them, and encourage them, and comfort them in the things that God wants. So prophecy doesn't serve for those that believe, don't believe, but it serves for those who believe. Therefore, that's why you don't really see very many tongues and interpretation uh, coming forth in services unless you have unbelievers that are coming in. And also, you don't want a whole lot of tongues uh, that are coming in because if you just have a bunch of tongues continually, it's not going to uh, help because a couple tongues is going to certainly make uh, get, get the hold of an unbeliever that, hey, must, something must be going on here. And then you, of course, want to bring the interpretation of tongues. Now, by the way, the interpretation of tongues, the ninth one, is a supernatural showing forth by the Holy Spirit of that which has been said in tongues. It is an interpretation, not a translation. And it's without human thinking. Some people think, well, I heard this tongues and it went on, da -da 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 -da. And then the interpretation went on and on and on and on and on. Well, it doesn't sound like it could be right because it was longer than the tongue or whatever. The interpretation of tongues is not a translation of what was said. It is an interpretation. It could be short or it could be long. It is a showing forth of what was said in the Spirit, but you don't compare it and think that it's got to be the same length in time. It's not a translation. It is an interpretation of it by the Holy Spirit. So, of course, this needs to happen. That uh, talks about here in verse 27, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now, the problem in Corinth, well, they had a misuse of things. One guy is speaking in tongues, and they didn't wait for anybody to interpret. Another one's coming out in his tongues, and they're just speaking all types of things. They were just totally out of order. God wanted everything to be in order. So what they were supposed to do was if someone spoke with a, a, in a tongue, they should wait for someone to interpret. And the interpreting, then, of course, he says, if there's no interpreter, let him keep silence in church. Let him speak to himself and to God. He shouldn't be bringing it forth. So we see these nine gifts of the Spirit, three of them, revelation gifts that reveal something, three of them, power gifts that do something, three of them are vocal gifts that are going to say something. And they're very important as God wants these to be in operation. Now, we should really seek after these gifts. How do we know this? In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, where it says, follow after charity, and the word follow actually means to run after, you really seek after to walk in the ways of love, and desire spiritual gifts. Now, desire is kind of a watered-down word. Desire would maybe to our vernacular would be, you know, I have a desire, I'd like, like to do that, that'd be a nice thing. Is that what it means? No. Because it mean, <coughs> excuse me, the mean, word means, it's zelo, ze which means to burn with zeal. You have a, you're zealous in pursuit of something. We're not talking about a casual desire. It'd be a nice thing to do. No. God is telling us that he is com actually commanding us to burn with zeal because this is an imperative mood verb. 
which means you and I are commanded. So otherwise, we're not going to sit on the sidelines and say, well, I know someone else will, will operate in the gifts of the Spirit. No, God's commanding every one of us. You should have an attitude in obedience to the Word of being zealous with, with boiling, as it says, with burning with zeal or, or boiling in the sense that you're really dr dr just a strong desire to do something, to seek after the gifts of the Spirit. And he also says, and rather that you may prophesy. God doesn't tell us that we should want to prophesy if we weren't going to be able to prophesy. He certainly would never say, just, you know, have a burning desire that you may prophesy if you couldn't, because we all can prophesy. Every one of us can operate in the gifts of prophecy. And that is something important that we understand as we look down here. We see in verse uh, 31, it says, you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn from what's coming forth because you're going to speak things. See, prophecy also has the effect of even teaching things as well as encouraging, exhorting, edifying, and also that all may be comforted. Now, I've heard some people, I had one person come to church a long, long, long time ago, and there were more than three prophecies in a particular service. He'd come up and says, your service is out of order. You can't have more than two or three prophecies. Uh, more than three prophecies, this is out of order. And I said, no, that's wrong. I said, it talks about two or three tongues, not prophecies. Some people had this mistaken thing that you could only have so many, and then you had to cut it off. It's like, we'll allow you three prophecies, Holy Spirit, and then no more after this. Sorry, your time's up. <laughs> no. Hey, the Holy Spirit may want to uh, take over the service, and prophecy after prophecy comes forth as he's bringing things forth through the congregation. You may all prophesy one by one, but all may learn and all may be comforted. Well, that should put in your heart, God wants me to prophesy. So I am going to have a strong, zealous desire and pursuit of prophesying. I'm going to covet to prophesy, as it talks about. And uh, so he wants us to prophesy. Now, we also see that another thing that's important. These gifts aren't just to operate just when you come to a certain level of maturity. We see in Acts chapter 19, verse 6, see, many people have had the mistaken idea, well, when I grow in the Lord, I get strong in the Lord, and you know, somewhere along the line, the Holy Spirit now, He sees that I'm kind of mature in the Lord, now I, He'll he want to operate through me. False. Look at this. This is where, at Ephesus, where Paul ministered the Holy Spirit. To those of you who remember where this was back in uh, verse 1, where he came to Ephesus, found certain disciples, and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? And their answer was, we've not so much as heard there where there be any Holy Spirit. These guys didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They were born again, but that was it. And then Paul, of course, ministered to them. And what did he do? He laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came on them, meant the Holy Spirit was received. Now, what happened then? You say, well, you're going to have to become real mature before anything's going to ever happen. They spake with tongues. They got their prayer language flowing. And prophesied. That means you can prophesy from day one that you get the Holy Spirit if that gift's in you and you are yielded to operate in that gift. So, it has nothing to do with maturity. It all has to do with gifts and a yielding to the Holy Spirit. So, we got to get that, so you got to get some of these things out of our mindset. We got the mindset that, well, you know, I, I don't know if God will use me in such and such. That's a lie. See, all these little lies that come in your mind hinder the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And if, he get, if, the Holy, if the devil can get you to believe some lies that, well, I've got to be certain maturity before I'll operate in it, you'll never be in a position to flow and function in the gifts of the Spirit because you believed a lie, and that will hinder him from seeing these things operate. Now, we also see back over in 1 Corinthians in chapter uh, 14, we go down to verse 12. Even so, ye, for as much as you are zealous, again, this shows that they were, they were zealous of spiritual gifts, and we should be. You see, what was going on in Corinth was there, was there were good things going on. They were zealous of the gifts of the Spirit. The problem was they had a misuse, and they had things out of order, and he had to correct them and get things in line so things were being done the right way. Be ze you're zealous of spiritual gifts, which we're supposed to be. Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Now, this word excel actually means to abound. I don't know why they translate it this way, because it's a word that really means to abound, 
Uh, it's translated that primarily, as you see in the usage. Here's the usage of it, translated 17 times. Here, the normal translation was abound. Seek that you may abound, and this is the way uh, Young brings us forth. Seek that you may abound, what? In these gifts of the Spirit, which means to increase and to develop in them to the edifying of the church. Otherwise, if God has placed a gift of the Spirit in you, which He has, and you say, oh, I operated in that once, once long ago. You know, and maybe once in a while God operates in that. Oh, no. If He give you a gift, it's not for it just to operate once in a while and then be dormant for the rest of the time and then operate, you know, every, every so often or whatever. All. No, He gave you that. He wants you to function in it. He wants you to seek to abound in this thing. Increase. Use this thing. Get this thing flowing. Otherwise, you have a gift of prophecy. You're going to be operating on that thing continually, whatever it might be. Like if you have a word of knowledge, God's going to use you in the word of knowledge continually. He's going to give you words of knowledge in things. Like my, my wife gets words of knowledge. She gets visions. She gets things. And God uses her regularly in that where she'll get a word of knowledge on things from time to time. It's not like it's just years and years, you know, oh, I had one years ago. No, it's going to function in you. In fact, we should look and seek for the Holy Spirit to, and be ready for Him to manifest in that particular gift. And notice also, what is the gifts of the Spirit going to do? They're going to edify the church. They're going to bring an edifying, a building up of the church to minister to the things in the body of Christ. Now, how do these work? First of all, they're by the Holy Spirit. Of course, you've got to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, first of all. Or, and they'll say, well, how did it work in the Old Testament? It also could work when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And it can work, that's not always that you have to have the Holy Spirit in you to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, even in the New Testament era. Remember in the Old Testament, these guys would prophesy, operate in the Revelation gifts. Did they have, were they born again? No. Did they have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them? No. But the Holy Spirit would come upon them. There was a filling of the Holy Spirit, an anointing upon them, and they would operate in these gifts in the Old Testament period, even though they weren't born again and have the Holy Spirit in you. So this is where I've seen people that have not received the Holy Spirit yet because maybe they had wrong teaching and they were, you know, maybe of a fundamentalist background, but yet they could have, they, they did what was necessary to get filled up with the Spirit and the Holy Spirit would manifest Himself and they would even see gifts of the Spirit in operation through them. Of course, the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you is going to see Him manifest a whole lot more than just from uh, filling from the outside, so to speak, from just anointing coming upon you. So once you have the Holy Spirit in you, and then we have the ability to get filled up with the Holy Spirit continually through praise, prayer, praying in tongues, in order to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and that's one of the keys. You want to do things so you get full of the Holy Spirit so you can be in a position for Him to function and flow through you. So. The way these work, oftentimes, and they can work different ways. Remember, there's different administrations or services, and they, work, they can work differently. But oftentimes, the Holy Spirit will bring words to your mind. He'll bring words, or something will come up. Sometimes it almost seems like it just springs forth up out of nowhere. Or, you know, so something just comes. It's not something you were thinking about before. It just comes to you. Like the way, I'll just tell you how things usually operate in me. I'll just be, you know, worshiping the Lord, and all of a sudden something will just come into my mind. It might be a word, it might be several words, or whatever it might be. And I know that that wasn't me bringing that. I know that was the thing that God wanted me to begin to speak forth. And you begin to speak that forth, and then what happens is, by the way, He's not going to give you the whole thing. Let's say He has a, a prophecy for you that you're going to maybe be, if you, you know, wrote it all down after it was out, Maybe it was like four sentences long or something. Well, he's not going to give you all four sentences long, and now you've got to memorize it and think of it and be able to re bring it out. No, it has nothing to do with that. He's going to give, remember, it's a flow of the Spirit by the Holy Spirit, but he's going to give you something to begin with. And he might give you a couple words of something. Well, that's what you begin to speak. And as you begin to speak that, what happens? More comes as you get in the flow, and you just follow the flow of the Holy Spirit. And he starts more things, you know, he might say a couple things, and then pretty soon you just, you just, this just keeps coming and it keeps flowing out of you as you're speaking what God has for you. Now, one thing you have to watch when you're prophesying, that you follow the flow of the Spirit, and when the flow of the Spirit stops, you stop. 
I've seen lots of people over years, they started out in the Spirit and followed the flow of the Spirit, but then they seemed to kind of go beyond that, and they were speaking things that were from the flesh, from themselves, and you can tell just by the witness of the Spirit, kind of like something happened there, and this, what's going forth now, now, this isn't coming from the Holy Spirit. This is a, these people are kind of going on. They got into their mind all of a sudden and started speaking things forth. No, we don't want to do that. And you don't need to gauge, well, I have to speak some long thing or whatever. You might just have a few words. You might have a longer thing, whatever it might be. All you do is you start speaking what the Holy Spirit brings and you follow the flow of what's coming out of you until you finish speaking what He wants. And that's just, just, a lot of times it just comes up with words to your mind. Also, sometimes, and I've had this happen, sometimes you won't even have a word. It's like an urging or something from the Holy Spirit within, and you know you're supposed to speak something. And you just open your mouth and you just begin, and it just begins to come out. But oftentimes, especially when you're first starting, it usually he'll give you something to kind of get you going, give you some, uh, some words so that you're going to speak that out. So when you're, and the other key is, when you come into the services, you come in and you start praising and worshiping God with all of your being and get your focus upon Him and get yourself all filled up with the Spirit. So it'd be good to do that before you come in, even praying in tongues on the way in or whatever all. Keep yourself filled up. You know, I guarantee if you're all, uh, you know, you're all these little problems you're worrying about or thinking about or all these negative things and your mind's embroiled with all these things, how are you going to be in tune for the Holy Spirit to flow? It's not going to happen, is it? No. In fact, you're a candidate to get ministered to so you can get yourself straight, you know. You're probably one that someone's going to prophesy to speak to you, you know. Don't be worried, you know. You might speak, so don't be afraid, you know, if something come forth. And yeah, that's right, I was giving place to the devil here. And that's God working through another person, bringing a prophecy to exhort you or, or something to direct you on what to do. So, we want to be in a position to be ready to flow in these gifts of the Spirit. Now, if you are hearing, this, a lot of times this will happen, you might have something come to you, and I've had, especially when people start out this way, when you're learning how to recognize the Holy Spirit bringing something to you to prophesy out. If a word comes to you, and then later on, maybe in, even sometimes in the service, in the midst of the praise and worship, like Renee will have this, where she'll have something comes to her while she's praising and worshiping God. And then later, she might have it come to her again, right before the, in the time, and she knows. If something's coming to you more than once, that's a sure sign God's trying to get your attention. You know, don't wonder why this keeps coming to my mind. That's the Holy Spirit. Don't wonder. Just be ready to deliver what He wants you to say. So if it's coming to you more than once, certainly pay attention. That's the Holy Spirit trying to get a hold of you. Now, when you begin to speak forth, you're speaking forth these prophecy with your faith. You're speaking it forth, allowing it to flow forth. Remember, it's not originating from your mind. You're not going to figure out what you're going to say. And you don't want to be all anxious. So what am I going to say after those few words that God gave me? You just speak it, follow the flow. When it finishes, stop. Don't go beyond it. All right? So also, sometimes you might have a vision. God might give you a vision, a little vision, and then see something. And then maybe he wants you to speak something out on top of that. Or sometimes there might be a vision, and he didn't speak something, but maybe you need to show that forth, reveal that. And let's say maybe some prophecies came forth, and then, you know, say, well, the Lord gave me a vision of something, and I need to share this. You share that. Share that vision in the flow of the things of the Holy Spirit. It's not out of order. You see, as we, when we come into the presence of God, what are we coming to do? Like an order of a service is what? We come here to minister unto him first to praise, to worship Him. Praise songs are usually faster songs, more up-tempo songs usually, kind of getting yourself praising and worshiping Him. When you get to the worship of so worshipful songs, they're softer usually, slower, you're more focused in. Praise songs are for all the things that He's done and so forth. Worship for songs are usually for who He is and your focus is really in on Him. And you pray and sing in tongues as well. It's really locking you into the presence of God. One thing that will help you is try to get, not let your mind get distracted and think about all these other things. That's why thinking about the words that you're singing and being involved in what I call participatory praise as you're doing it will really get you locked in to the things of the Spirit. And so you're just so tuned in, your mind's not thinking of all these other things. And you're filled up with the Holy Spirit. 
He's ready to bring things forth from you. Now, sometimes he may even give you a, a part of a scripture that you might speak. It might be words that aren't necessarily a part of an exact scripture, but they're a scriptural principle what's the, uh, nonetheless. You want to learn to speak those things and let those things flow forth. Now, remember that we are to have a strong desire for these things. As it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, desire these burn with zeal, seeking after the gifts of the Spirit. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak them out. Now, one thing that things do need to be done decently and in order, which is what he was correcting them on, we see it back in verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. So, let's say you have a prophecy, you know, you want to bring it forth in the right time. For instance, let's say you're in the midst of praising and worshiping God and you've got a, a words coming to you. Is that the time to blurt it out? In the, you know? No, that'd be out of order because we're still praising and worshiping God. But to see, as you minister to the Lord, that's ministering to Him, then we're going to be quiet and listen to Him, and that's Holy Spirit time for Him to minister back to us. That's a time when we're ready, that's a time when gifts of the Spirit will operate. And a lot of times the Holy Spirit will bring forth one thing, and then He might bring forth another thing from someone else. You know, so you want to kind of follow an order, you know. Don't be so anxious, just kind of, if something comes to you, you know, and you just are prompted, speak it forth. If someone else starts to speak something, that doesn't mean, oh, God doesn't want me to speak that. No, it means you're just, he's just, you're just, something else is coming forth first, yours is going to be coming forth after that. And then you bring that forth and begin to speak and bring those forth one after another. Remember, it says that you, let, you can all prophesy one by one. So it'd be one after another after another. And you want to flow forth in it. Now let's talk about hindrances to operate in the gifts of the Spirit for a little bit. One is fear. Many people are afraid, afraid of what, you know, that I don't know if I can do this or not. Fear is the opposite of faith, and it will shut down the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit in you. Is God giving you a spirit of fear? No. Are we to operate and have, ever have fear in our life? No. Not from the, the Word of God. We even see a scripture in Luke chapter 1, down here in verse uh, 74 and 75, says that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve Him without fear. In what are we doing? We're serving God with the prophecy and the gifts of the Spirit. In holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our life. So fear is from the enemy. Fear will hinder and stop the gifts of the Spirit from operating. Another thing, of course, is doubt. Well, I don't know if that was from the Lord or not. Well, if he brought this something to you that's in line with the scriptures that you weren't even thinking about, and it was in, after you've been ministering to the Lord, praising and worshiping him, and it comes out of nowhere, you have to know that it came for a reason. It would be the Holy Spirit bringing things forth. Don't doubt and wonder. That's, unfortunately, many people doubt. And, you know, maybe, you, know you don't want to make a mistake, of course, but... You don't want to sit there and let yourself get into doubt or hesitate. A lot of times people hesitate. Well, I don't know if this is from the Lord or not, or whether I should be saying this or whatever all. And you can just kind of miss the boat. I've had people in the past where they did hesitate and they did kind of doubt. And then later on, something would come forth that would show them, hey, that was a gift of the Spirit that I was supposed to bring forth. Maybe in the message I would speak some things out or maybe someone else later would have a, a, a manifestation of the gift that spoke the same thing that God gave them. I've had people. Otherwise, God gave them some words. They were hesitant. They were doubt. They didn't bring it forth. And so because they didn't, the Holy Spirit's going to find someone else. And so he found someone else, and they speak for, well, it's the same thing that was coming to me. Well, why is that? Because the, you didn't bring it forth. That's not for condemnation, but God wanted to bring that forth, so he finds someone else. But when that happens... That certainly should alert you, hey, guess what? That was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And when those kind of things are happening, that should help you to know the Holy Spirit is wanting to use me to speak things forth. So then the next time that happens, you're ready to move forth and speak it. Of course, a fear of making a mistake is another thing. No, we need to trust the Holy Spirit. Trust the Holy Spirit. He wants to speak forth by the, through you. Be ready to speak. You know, you're going to learn and develop in these things. You know, you're not going to be a perfect prophesier, you know, bing, 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 just everything perfect, when, usually when you first start out. You develop 
in anything that you do. Also, another, of course, of big hindrances is not prepared to move in the Spirit. If you come and you're praising and worshiping God, but you're not even prepared or even thinking about let a God operating through you, you're not even going to be tuned into Him. It's kind of like, you know, you're, instead of turn, tuned into His frequency, you're out over here tuned into some other frequency. You're not going to be in tune with Him. You've got to be looking for the Holy Spirit to flow through you, not to try to make something happen, but to be ready to flow forth. Many are not prepared to move in the Spirit. And don't sit there and think, well, God really doesn't want to use me. That's a lie. He wants to use every person. Get that lie out of your mind. We already know He wants to use you, and so we need to be ready. Now, some people have a wrong fear of God. I'm afraid what God might do if I speak the wrong thing. Hey, the fear of God should inspire you to be obedient. I'd rather speak the thing, you know, that God's given me instead of, not, instead of miss God and not speak what He wants. No, we need to have the, the right fear of God is the reverential respect and awe of Him and submission to Him that, hey, I'm, I'm going to speak whatever you want me to speak. I'm not going to miss this. I'm not going to hold this back whatsoever. Another thing is many people will say, well, I just feel unworthy. This has nothing to do with your un whether you feel unworthy or whatever, or I'm just not good enough. Remember, this has nothing to do with you anyway. This all has to do with the Holy Spirit. So I don't care what your situation is. You say, well, I'm not holy enough, or I haven't been delivered enough, or all these kind of things. Well, we're all in a work in process. Does that mean that God can't, God can't use you? No, He can use you. Remember, they used those guys from day one. And they, you know, they hadn't even grown in anything, or developed in anything, or been delivered of anything. They were just you know, had the Holy Spirit and spoken tongues, and now here they are prophesying. He's just looking for yielded vessels. Also, many people draw back from wanting to operate or rebellious to or disobedient to. That's a mistake. God has given to every man the manifestation of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, to profit with all. This is part of your ministry. We need to take this attitude that this is part of my ministry of what God wants to operate. So I am going to be ready to flow. Since I've been commanded to seek after these zealously, it's imperative, hey, I'm going to do it in obedience to Him. You know, if we won't be obedient to serve God and help and let Him use us to flow through the gifts He's placed in us, why should He help us in other things that we want Him to help us to? You know, if we're resistant to Him in one thing, how do you think God's going to help you in your situation over here? If you'll serve God here, Guess what? God will come on the scene and help you in other situations later. That's why we need to get the attitude is, hey, I want to be obedient. I'm not going to be standoffish to the gifts of the Spirit or reason in my mind and think I can't do it. all these lies. We've got to get all these hindrances put underfoot. Also, a lot of times the devil will try to bring confusion in your mind and get through, you know, something comes to your mind and then he'll shoot something else into your mind, some negative thing. Well, the thing that's in line with the Word is from the Lord. The other thing, from the devil, you know, well, you can't do that. You're not good enough. Or you're, you know, think about you. Why should you be doing such and such? Cast that thing down in a moment. That's the devil lying to you. Be ready to cast down those thoughts and bring things forth uh, so that you can speak what God wants. Another hindrance is people having a fear of speaking in front of people or speaking out in public. Well, we need to get over that. You got to get rid of that. Just, you know, lock in, you know, to the Holy Spirit to speak it forth. Sometimes you may, well, it's hard for me to speak in front of you. I get real nervous. It'd be better to speak it out and kind of fight through that nervousness. And once you get flowing in it, you'll find that that will go. That's just the enemy trying to stop you. Many people have a problem speaking out in public. Well, we're going to cast out, work on casting out those spirits of fear and get yourself set mindset. Hey, I'm going to flow in these kinds of things. Uh, another thing is uh, sin in your life, of course, will hinder. You know, if your sin, how are you going to see the Holy Spirit manifest Himself if we got sin in our life? We should, we should have confessed our sin before we come into the assembly of the believers. Now, we want to eliminate all these hindrances. You get rid of all these hindrances, and you'd be in a position to flow. God's going to use you. He wants to use you. He wants to develop you. Because you say, well, was it so important? It might be. Well, really important. One day, God might give you something. If someone comes in here, and you need to speak something to them that they need to hear. Maybe they even have suicidal thoughts about them, and they happen to come to church, and they need to hear what you, God, gave you to speak so that they don't go out, and it can be encouraging or help them to come to the place so they don't go out and do some evil things. See? 
uh, you never know what God can flow forth through you. That's why it's also going to really develop you in ministry, in uh, really serving the Lord. And also, a lot of times when you begin to prophesy, it open, opens you up to a lot of other gifts to operate in conjunction with that. Now, another thing that we see is we also want to see prophets operate and speak forth. Now, a prophet is someone who has not... If you have the revelation gifts, that doesn't mean you're necessarily a prophet. A prophet is a specific call, and prophets are to be in the church. We want to see people be raised up in their ministry in this place. If you have a call to be a prophet or whatever it is, remember there were the prophets and the teachers, you know, in the church, and they were ministering to the Lord, and the Holy Spirit would speak. God wants to give the prophets opportunity to speak. Now, I've had people in the past that had that calling, and one particular one wondered why I never had the person speak in the church actually publicly speaking, be, uh, as, far, as far as getting up in, in, like from the pulpit and stuff. Well, I told them, I said, well, because that's not what the Bible says. The prophets stand up in the midst of the congregation to speak with a, by the Holy Spirit after you've ministered to the Holy Spirit to bring things forth. In other words, let's say we have a couple prophets here and we've ministered to the Lord, and yet the, who's, who's going to bring forth the Word? The prophet's not going to bring forth the teaching of the Word because that's not his gifting. But the pastor teacher is going to bring that forth because that's his gifting, and he's going to bring that forth. So what's the prophet going to do? He should stand up and speak forth whatever God gives him. He can stand up every time, and he may go on for a while. Otherwise, if there's prophets that have something revealed to them, they may stand up and start speaking that forth to the entire congregation and bringing revelation of the things that God is telling them to speak forth. So, in other words, prophets, they don't have to have an imitation to come. If they're a prophet, then they have the platform from the Word of God to get up and bring forth what they have in any meeting that they have. That's really the way it should happen in a New Testament sense. There should be given, if people that understand, prophets are supposed to be able to speak. Let the prophets speak, two or three. So if God raises you up into a prophet, a prophet's ministry, not talking about the gifts of the Spirit, we're talking about a prophet ministry, then God's going to expect you to bring things forth and speak the things that He's given you, and you will stand up and just deliver those things. It's not like you have to be asked, okay, prophet, do you have anything? No, you're going to stand up and give the things that God wants at the appropriate time in the flow of the Spirit. And they're also going to be involved in judging. Also, the point is the pastor and those would certainly judge things uh, in line with the Word of God. And let's talk about uh, judgmental, judging uh, gifts of the Spirit, first of all. Because we want to be sure that things are right, of course, because you can have people sometimes come in and speak wrong things. And let's cover this for a couple minutes before we close. John chapter 16, verse 13. Notice the Holy Spirit. It's speaking of him, it says, For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. So the Holy Spirit doesn't originate things. He receives things from above. And so he's speaking things from Jesus means they have to come in line with the Word of God. He shall glorify me. That's Jesus doing the speaking. Everything that the Holy Spirit speaks will always glorify the Lord. That means it doesn't attract attention to man. Gifts of the Spirit that so-called or come forth from people that are attracting attention to man, they're not coming from the Lord. Instead, they're coming from people. So, it's going to glorify the Lord, and it's not going to glorify man. We also see a scripture over in Revelation chapter 19 that even shows it's going to be the testimony of Jesus in some aspect that comes forth. We even see this in Revelation 19.10 where it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy will always testify about the things of Jesus, which means it's going to bring things forth in line with the Word of God. Also, as we mentioned, the scriptures, the, 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 the prophecies must be in line with the scriptures. If someone speaks something forth that's not in line with the scriptures, then we know, guess what? It didn't come from the Holy Spirit. This may either an error that's coming from them or some other wrong spirits operating. He even goes on and says in Isaiah 8.20, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. No, anything that we speak is to be in line with the word of God. Now, if there's revelation in it, and this is something that needs to be tested, if there is revelation in it, then 
it needs to be checked to find out if it's too, true. Like I've had people say, well, I have a word of knowledge, or God showed me the fact that so-and-so, there's somebody here that has such and such. Well, usually what I'll do then is I'll say, who has that problem? God wants to minister to you. He's wanting, you know, otherwise, we're wanting to, we're acknowledging that problem, and we're wanting to see the Holy Spirit flow through that situation, 